it, you know, stop, clear, go. Jesus, I don't know what happened to me. Nothing, that was fine as far as I was concerned. Yeah, it was. Hello, everyone. This is the 67th take of my introduction that I'm doing right now. As you can see, I'm sweating. Uh, okay, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode... Hello, everyone. I'm off my game. I need more rum. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 31 of Making Sense. My name is Emil Kalinowski. I am joined by Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Investments. We're going to do a show that's three parts. And in the first part, we're going to talk about the difference between a banking regulator and a central bank and how that it's affecting your economy and your finances. Jeff, good morning. Good morning, Emil. Remember, we're talking about a domestic bank regulator versus a central bank. And the word domestic kind of sounds like, eh, maybe it's not important, but it really means everything, especially in the context of a global monetary system. Absolutely. And we're going to get into that. The, you know, people often ask you, what would you do if you were in charge? And uh, people never ask me that question. But if they did ask me that, I would say, well, I would start nominating people that are aware of the euro dollar system. And in your article at Real Clear Markets today on the 16th of October, it's called Bond Yields Are Really Quite Easy to Understand. You introduce us to an individual whose name is Marvin Goodfriend. He was the Trump's nominee to a Federal Reserve board, FOMC board seat back in November of 2017. Uh, and he had a pretty contentious uh, nomination process. It didn't really go anywhere. The, the Senate Banking Committee uh, forwarded his nomination to the floor on a 13 to 12 vote. But, uh, you know, some of the senators kept bringing up some of the things he said, especially, you know, good friend was an inflationist. He was a hawk. He always said, you know, inflation's right around the corner. And, you know, one of the more famous things he said was in 2012, that if, if the unemployment ever uh, unemployment rate ever got below 7%, watch out. It was going to be like the 1970s again. So he had constantly advocated for tight money policy year after year after year after year, which you can, Im you can imagine that uh, the opposition party in the Senate used to great effect in his nomination process. So even though his, his nomination was forwarded to, full sen to the full Senate floor, it was never acted on. He never even got a vote, and it just quietly went, went away. There's a quote from Senator Elizabeth Warren, quote, and she's speaking to Goodfriend, these wrong predictions are not outliers for you. And she also said, we can't take a chance on someone with a decades long record of prioritizing hypothetical inflation over real people losing their jobs. Jeff, which predictions were, was Senator Warren referring to? I guess you just explained oh, it to right. us. I you know, that's the thing. Good friend's nomination, what he was saying was really no different than anybody else at the Fed. They keep saying, you keep seeing and predicting and forecasting this breakout of inflation. And, and you know, the lower the unemployment rate goes, the more confident they are this inflation thing's going to happen. And of course, you know, in a, in a political setting like this, they're just setting themselves up to be bashed over the head with their own words. But yet, why does it only play out in in this one you know political arena? Why are we? Why are these uh, these central bankers and economists only made to account when it's a political thing? Why isn't the public asking the same questions? Not just of Marvin Goodfriend, who by the way passed away late late last year, but all Fed officials. They keep saying these things. Their predictions, you know, these bad predictions, as Senator Warren said, are not outliers. They are the base case, and so. Why, why is that the case? Why is it the case that they keep getting this inflation thing wrong, which is central to what a central bank is supposed to do? And that's really the overriding point here. What I, always, what I say a lot is that you know, I, a central bank is not central, and it's really just trying to play on words. What I actually mean is something beyond that. Um, and, and the reason I say a central bank is not central and don't go further most of the time is because you often lose people when you say that. People who are already skeptical because they see this, you know, central bank is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's in all our education. It's on TV. It's everywhere. And if you say to somebody who's not, not familiar with your argument that a central bank's not central, they already think you're crazy. And so if you, you can't really tell them the real thing, which is, oh, by the way, the central bank isn't central because it's not even a central bank. And then, you know, forget it. You're going to just lose everybody at that point. But that's really what, we're made, what, we're made, what we uh, mean when we say this, is that the central bank, the Federal Reserve, ECB, whatever it is, they don't really perform the role 
that we all think of when we think of a central bank. And that's really the key here. And when you look at Marvin Goodfriend's history and his career, you can start to see what we're really talking about. Because Goodfriend was a guy who was a researcher. He was a researcher at the Richmond Fed going way, way back into the great inflation. And so, you know, the fact that he came up during the great inflation obviously has colored his view of everything. But still, he was a guy who was thorough. He was very, you know, studious. He was also, uh, you know, he was very dependable in doing all this research at the Federal Reserve, or at least at the Richmond branch. And one of the things he was very good about was, hey, there's this enormous, gigantic euro dollar market out there. And I think, you know, maybe we should pay attention to it. That's right. We're going to talk about the great inflation in a later part of this episode. But the great inflation was during the 1970s, primarily. Let's move to and what was behind that great inflation. As you said, good friend was researching the Euro, what he called the euro currency market. And you quote him from an article or a report of his. And I want to go through his quote just to explain it to people. It's going to be kind of a rapid fire questions to you. And then if you can give an overview of the main message of this quote and why he included it. So in 1981, he wrote, quote, as of mid-1980, Morgan Guarantee estimated the gross size of the euro currency market to be at $1.31 trillion. So euro currency, Jeff, here, does that mean dollars, pounds, francs, marks that are held outside of their respective countries? Yes. Remember the term euro before a currency just means offshore. In the okay. offshore market, which is primarily euro dollars, but you know when I when we refer to the euro dollar market, we're really referring to this offshore currency market that can be in any kind of denomination. It's a bank centered market that uh, exists outside of national boundaries and regulatory structures. And then he continues and he says the net size was put at six hundred and seventy billion. What does that mean? The net size. Well, the what we're you know a lot of times because of the complex accounting and because a lot of this, this shadow stuff, you know there's the potential for double counting things. And so central bankers in particular are always on the lookout for. You know, we don't want to double count. We want to estimate the size of something. And so if it's an interbank transfer, for example, is that new money? Is it the same money moving around? All these other things. Long story short, what happens is a general rule in these cases is that in the academic literature and in the official circles. If an American bank holds a euro dollar asset or liability or whatever, whatever they're looking at, it's netted out because there's a theoretical belief, supposition, that American banks don't create these dollars outside the U.S. They're, they're exclusively a borrower of something else that's created on their behalf. So American bank holdings, by and large, are netted out, leaving mostly non-bank participants. It sounds like you're saying... There's a legitimate reason to net it out, but you're also saying maybe not. The, the both There's answers- a legitimate reason if you believe in the, the idea that American banks don't create dollars outside the U.S., which I believe is absolutely the, false. Yeah, illegitimate. It's funny because, you know, we're talking about estimates that were provided by Morgan Guarantee, not the Federal Reserve. And that's, you know, that's an important point. Here we have a researcher at the Richmond Fed, a very good researcher at the Richmond Fed, who in, in one sense is saying, look, I have to go outside of the central bank just to get these estimates. And Morgan Guarantees is, a, is a, one of the few banks in anywhere that was interested in the euro dollar market and took the time and effort to go after these statistics. And remember, you know, even Milton Friedman's one time he talked about the euro dollar, the euro dollar market in the early 70s, the euro dollar first principles, that was, that was reprinted from a speech he gave at Morgan Guarantee. So Morgan Guarantee, more than anybody back at that time period, was almost exclusively interested in this monetary system, and they kept estimating, you know, they kept trying to figure out how do we estimate this, and what they came up with in 1980 was the thing that it was more than a trillion, I mean, 1980, a trillion dollars was an impossibly big number. I mean, that was beyond all comprehension, and here we have this one, this offshore currency market that's already two-thirds the size of the, the entire domestic monetary system, and only this one bank is even trying to estimate it. That's right. That Morgan Guarantee reference with uh, Milton Friedman was 1969, and he estimated at that time that it was $30 billion big, 1969. And right now we're at 1981, and we're thinking $1.3 Let me continue with the quote. He says, 
M2 is the narrowest United States monetary aggregate that includes euro dollar deposits. M2 includes overnight euro dollar deposits held by the United States non bank residents at Caribbean branches of Federal Reserve member banks. A little bit confusing. So, if I understand, M2 includes dollars held by US citizens and businesses that are not banks in the Caribbean. True? Yeah, that's the old version of M2. That part was moved into M3. Uh, don't ask me the date, but <laughs> at the time, that part of the euro dollar. That small part of segment of the euro dollar system was included in M2. But again, it was re, it, the idea of including it in the quote was to reinforce the message that this is an offshore thing that doesn't really impact the US if you don't pay attention to the vast majority of it. <laughs> and then he continues as of June 1980, M2 measured one bill, one, 1,587 billion, and that euro dollar component was only 2.9 billion. So M2 money in the USA was 1.587 trillion and only a tiny sliver of that was US dollars offshores held by US citizen people businesses. Is that right? Yeah. And so the rest of the 1.3 trillion in the euro currency market is separate and distinct. And I guess that's the big picture that we're trying to get away. He's because but then you note that at the time M3, which is the largest measure of money that was in place at that time, that that well, was... M3 was the second broad. There was something called L, which was okay. supposed to be most comprehensive, but that fell out of favor. Even too. So M3 was the most common broad money definition. And that number was 1.85 trillion. Jeff, does the 1.85 trillion, is that inclusive of the 1.5 M2 number? Yes. Okay, so... $1.85 trillion M3 in the United States versus $1.3 trillion offshore outside of the United States that's not under the Federal Reserve's purview. Is that not the big picture right. message? Not only is it not under the Federal Reserve purview, they don't even care enough to measure it or study it or do any monitoring about it. It's left to individual banks like Morgan Guarantee to do something like this. So you're already, you can already appreciate the dichotomy, disconnect here, right? We have this offshore monetary system that's enormous. And it started out from practically nothing, as you pointed out, Emil. You know, I think the Morgan Guarantee's best estimates going, uh, going backwards they thought maybe at, 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 at most it was about $50 billion in the early 60s. I know Milton Friedman said $30 billion in the late 60s, but Morgan Guarantee later said, you know, there's more to it because there's always more to it. And so we go from practically nothing to multiple trillions all during this great inflationary period, which is somehow inflationary, right? And the Federal Reserve says, well, it's, it's outside the U.S. We don't care. And this, And it's not just about the the stock, but it's about the rate of change. And I remember a 1979 uh, article by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the winter 1979-80 quarterly review, which I was a couple years old at the time and I read it. Sure, it was good. Let me quote it. The euro markets grew rapidly during the 1970s. All the measures of the euro market size increased at annual rates of above 25% by comparison a broad measure of the United States money supply that includes large negotiable certificates of deposits and time deposits grew at an annual rate of 10% between 1970 and mid 1979, as did a broad measure of German money supply. This money that was two thirds as big in 1980 was growing at two and a half times the rate of the official money. But nobody cares, right? This is all offshore. It doesn't matter. We're a central bank, right? We're a central bank that, that looks at half the monetary system and thinks, ah, not important. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's the idea here. The Fed is supposed to be a central, you know, is the Fed supposedly in charge of the money system or is the Fed really in charge of the banking system? And you think those two things are the same thing. But they're really not. And when you get down into the details, you can start to see not only that it's the case, the Fed is not a central bank. It's also the case that this really, really matters. Let me read a remarkable quote that I'm not quite sure what to do with. Let me read it here. What's the problem? 
why hasn't the Fed done a better job? I am going to argue today that one reason, and maybe the main reason, is that the Fed does not now have, and it never has had, a clear congressional mandate to stabilize the price level. Consequently, the Fed's successes in stabilizing the price level in at least some periods of its history has been and continues to be a function largely of one, prevailing general economic conditions, two, the strength of the Federal Reserve's leaders, and three, old-fashioned luck. What, who, why, when? Well, first of all, that was Al Broadus. <laughs> and believe me, we double-checked. We triple-checked that it was Al this time. And it wasn't just Al Broadus, the president of the Richmond Fed back in, I think it was 1991 or two, or early 90s sometime. It was also Al Broadus with the support of Marvin Goodfriend who wrote this, uh, I believe it was an article published in, uh, well, at least it's, it's published now at the Minneapolis Fed. And what they were saying is something I think people don't appreciate. Al was admitting, along with Marvin, saying that, listen, the, Fed's, the Fed throughout its history has absolutely sucked. This modern idea that the Fed is a group of technocratically wise stewards who do all sorts of amazing things that can control markets and economies at the flip of a switch that's a fairly recent invention. Through much of its history, the Federal Reserve has been one awful institution that just screws up time and time and time again. And what Al and Marvin were saying in the early 90s was, the few times that it got things right, we really don't know why. <laughs> you know, the, here are these Fed guys saying, we struggle to explain why the good times are actually good. And yet, in the modern view, the, green, the post-Greenspan era, we're supposed to attribute any good time to um, you know, the Federal Reserve's action when really, again, throughout its history, the Federal Reserve has an awful history. It doesn't, it doesn't even know why, when things are going good, that it, they're going good and has no idea what it was doing. So what Al was saying is like, maybe it's Congress's fault. <laughs> we haven't given us a clear mandate. Jeff, when one reads these technical reports by monetary technocrats, they're filled with jargon, technocratic words, and it's very hard to understand. So when you come across a phrase like willy-nilly or good luck, you know, it lodges in my mind and I remember it. And this mention of good luck is not the only one. What's the other uh, important message or important reference to good luck in recent Federal Reserve history? You're right. You know, Emil, you're right. It runs contrary to the narrative or the idea that we have of a central bank being this scientific institution that can do all of these things in a scientific fashion. And you stop and you think, good luck. What the hell does good luck have to do with a central bank? And yet that phrase repeats constantly throughout the literature because, again, these guys have no idea how to even explain the good times, let alone the bad. The screw, now we haven't even get to the bad times yet. And the, the, the phrase random good luck was used again in, in 2003 by a couple of economists from Princeton. Uh, I think they're both Princeton. Uh, James, Mark Watson, and J James Watson. What is the stock in Watson? <laughs> uh, they were the ones who coined the phrase great moderation. And the reason they did coin the phrase great moderation was because that, that period in time, really from the time of Al Broadus in the, in the early 90s until the you know, early 2000s, was an isolated case where things were going right. Again, that was outside of normal experience, especially for the Federal Reserve. Things seemed to be stable, not just uh, prices, but also the economy globally. And what they were saying is, we don't know why. We have no idea why that was the case. We have some ideas. You know, this cult of personality around the Federal Reserve chairman, therefore doing signaling, expectations management, all these other things. But by and large, we attribute it like Broadus and Goodfriend had done a decade before to random good fortune, good luck. That's not the that's not the picture the Federal Reserve presents in public because again, it's supposed to be a technocratic scientific institution rather than flying by the seat of its pants. And that's really the point of going back through Good Friend's history was that when exploring the Euro dollar system, he's saying there's this massive thing out there that we don't care about, that we don't measure, we don't we don't really factor, and yet maybe that's the good luck. Maybe that's the thing that has made it look like we are wise monetary stewards because we're riding this euro dollars coattails. And I think, you know, if you have the, if you have the numbers from 1988, Morgan Guarantees updated numbers, you can start to see what we're talking about. Because remember, back in 1980, it was like 1.3 trillion, the, the, the full currency market. 
By the time you get to 1988, what's the uh, what's the exact figure, Emil? Do you have it in front of you? I do not have it. I thought it was 1.8 trillion. Let me. I can pull it up here. Yeah, it was. A, it was. It was. A, I think it was more than that, and it was much, much bigger. In 1988, Morgan Guarantee, by the way, stopped tabulating these euro dollar estimates and the reason they stopped tabulating their euro dollar estimates is because they couldn't they could no longer it had gotten not just quantitatively bigger but also qualitatively all sorts of financial innovation took place during the 80s especially talking about interest rate swaps currency swaps and also other forms of derivatives that made it technically impossible at least within the limited budget or limited expenses that morgan guarantee could 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 uh, provide for this kind of an effort so at 1988, they said, look, man, this thing is huge already, and we can't keep track of it. And it so was, you would think. It was $4.6 trillion, yes. and if you net it, then it was $2.6 trillion. So here we go from well, the gross amount was 1.3 roughly in 1980 to 1988, 4-point-something trillion, which, by the way, as good friend noted in the early 90s, that number in 1988 was already larger than M2 was in 1991. So the euro currency market and throughout the 1980s had surpassed the domestic monetary system, which was growing at a relatively good pace on its own. And so we have massive offshore money going on, and yet these guys at the Fed are saying, well, it's all just good luck. No, it's not good luck. It's you guys are only paying attention to what you want to pay attention to, and you're riding the coattails of monetary growth you don't factor and you don't you don't you don't care about, and that's creating all of this you know global economic activity, globalization, stable money supply, stable um, stable economic conditions, stable prices around the world, except for credit bubbles, obviously, and yet the Fed is trying to create this idea that it's all just good luck or it's monetary policy or it's Alan Greenspan moving the federal funds rate, an unimportant domestic money rate around a quarter point here or there. And then, of course, we get to 2007, 2008, and what happens? The good luck runs out, which means the euro dollar stopped running out. And what that meant as far as the Fed is concerned is nothing more than everything returning back to normal. The Fed throughout its most of its history has absolutely sucked. It does not do a good job as a central bank. And the reason it hasn't in the euro dollar era is because it's not a central bank. It is a domestic bank regulator. I remember George Friedman, the geopolitical strategist, once saying that Americans have very low opinions of their leaders, and therefore, they're rarely disappointed. And that would be applicable in the, our case with our central bank if our economics professors, our business executives, the financial media saw the central bank as a domestic banking regulatory authority and not in charge of modern money supply. As we've been talking about, they don't care what's going on beyond the borders. There was a regulator from the Federal Reserve, Mr. Corliss, that spoke this week. What did Randall Corliss, supervisor of banks, say to, uh, to the media this week? He said, everything is great. We've got everything well under control, except for these money markets we can't seem to get under control. <laughs> you know, it's a, uh, apart from that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? <laughs> you know, it's, it's no, it, it, look, when you're a domestic bank regulator, what Quarles was saying is that, look, you know, we haven't had a repeat of Lehman Brothers, even though what happened in March was severe, severe strains across the world, but no banks failed. So obviously, we've done our job. As a domestic bank regulator, that makes perfect sense because the banking system today is nothing like what it was back in 2008. The question we have, and we should ask that he will never will, is that, does that really mean anything? Does that really make a difference? The fact that the domestic banking system is hunkered down in their own bunker is actually a symptom of the problem, and it didn't take regulations to do that because they already started doing that as early as August 2007. So the banks don't take risks anymore. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, from the perspective of the Fed as a domestic banking regulator, it's a good thing because banks aren't risky anymore. And so we're not going to see bank failures, which is, by the way, I've said all along, I don't think we're going to see bank failures anymore because banks are fine, especially domestic banks. But that doesn't mean everything is fine. And that was the other part of his speech, which was, you know, these short-term markets, these money markets that are, you know, kind of weird and we struggle to explain, we don't really pay much attention to, they don't seem to be fixed at all. 
So the bank, domestic banks are good, but these dollar markets that you know we know go outside the United States to these massive, huge numbers, they don't seem to be fixed. And so which one do we really care about moving forward? Quarrel says, ah, domestic banks are great. Nothing to worry about. Inflation future down the road. But yet, if you were, if you were taking Marvin Goodfriend's work and extrapolating that forward, you would think he's counting on random good luck yet again, when we've had nothing but quote unquote bad luck since August of 2007. Cordless's speech is going to be linked in the show notes, as well as my phone number if anyone's looking for a good time. Jeff, we're going to move on to the next section, next section of our uh, presentation. Ah, ah, God, so, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jeff. All right, Jeff, the uh, Corliss's presentation is linked in the show notes, and I don't know where I'm at. Let me drink some <laughs> stiff whiskey. More, drink more. Okay. I don't know what happened. I had a great run this morning. I was on top of the world. I loved your articles this week. I was so excited to do the show. And then for some reason, as soon as the show started, I'm off. I'm leaning on my crutch that I can, I don't have to be on because I can, uh, you know, it's not a live show. I don't know what's wrong with me right now. All right. Let me continue. I think it's fairly common. It's, you know, you, it's easy to do it in practice. And then when the game throws up, it's, you, Human nature, you just tense up, you, you know, you start thinking about things you shouldn't be thinking about. I know. I felt so good, though. I felt so good. I don't know why. Uh, so, Mr. Corliss's speech is linked in the show notes as well as my phone number in case anyone's looking for a good time. 